welcome you to uh, what I believe is the third uh, final presentation of a work package project. We have, in the first wave of projects, we have 18 and they're all giving a, a final um, presentation. The presentation will be given by Arthur, who is a mathematician, I believe, in the aerospace faculty of University of Bristol. Whilst his normal work is uh, all uh, around trajectory optimizers and the mathematics of those, for this project, he's looked at the way in which a human supervisor or an air traffic controller would interact with a trajectory optimizer or a conflict resolution advisory system, for example. So it's the, the, uh, the two-directional interaction of, of the human operator with the, uh, with the trajectory optimizer. And I'll let, I'll let you explain that in detail. Thanks very much, Dirk. Good morning, everyone. Dirk's already introduced me, I'm Arthur Richards, I also want to recognise the work of my postdoc Oliver Turnbull, who's been working with me on this project, it's, uh, um, it's, it's just, us, just one entity, so just the University of Bristol, uh, it's just me and Ollie working on it, so it's a very small team presenting compared to some of the projects you may see, but, uh, but this is it and here we are. So, our plan if they pick out from various parts of the CESAR concept of operations and master plan and things like this, you'll find these desires. The desire for greater use of automation, the desire for trajectory-based automation, and for the human still to be at the center of decision making. So these are things that we are, apparently we want. Um, if you go out into the research community, what you'll find is that things that we already have are an awful lot of trajectory optimizers. People in robotics and control have been looking at these things for years. Lots and lots of different ones exist. They can do lots of different things. Um, our question that we ask in SuperOpt is whether or not uh, these things, the optimizers we have, can be part of the solution to the problems that we've posed ourselves. The catch is that the optimizers we have aren't particularly well developed for human interaction. That's simply what they've, not what they've been designed to do. So they've essentially got two ways of working with the things. You can get an answer, so you'll get a bunch of numbers and that's it. You can figure out whether or not you like that and you can then move on. You either take it or leave it. Or you can get heavily into the details or the mathematics of it, which is great. I love doing the maths. This is what I do for a living. And you start defining functions f, t, and h, and you can write your mathematical optimization, minimize f subject to a set of equality constraints, a set of inequality constraints, and off you go. And that's great, but it's a very, very mathematical way of working. And if you go and have a look at the gory details of this, it's not really something that anyone's going to sit there operationally and be playing around with. And so therefore, our question is whether or not can, we can find easier ways of working with the optimizers. So the concept is this, that we over here we have the optimizer which has uh, the very mathematical interfaces. So you put in these weird wonderful mathematical functions and you get out x star, an optimized solution in a set of numbers. We're interested in these boxes here, the translation behind. Uh, so we get something in from a supervisor which somehow conveys intent and then we give something back which is a set of suggestions of our response to that intent. And that is translated in some way, and so you're sort of protecting, if you like, the supervisor from having to work with the, uh, with the beautiful but quite fiddly mathematics. We are not human factors experts. So what we haven't looked at in this is what goes on the front of the switch panel here. We are the back of house translation between the intent and the mathematics. So you'll see some displays and some examples. Um, they've got too many colors on them. They're not very well spaced. They're not very clear to read. They're not easy to use. This is not what we have looked at, but those questions remain open. But hopefully we've, we've achieved something anyway. So um, I'm going to introduce the case study that we use uh, and, uh, that, that we'll be seeing throughout this. The case study is a multi-sector controller. So uh, this, you know, this isn't something we've invented. We adapted it. We took this particular version of it out of the ADAR, um, CESAR project. Um, so we've come up with a nice big area of airspace that I'll show you in a minute. It's uh, sort of several different areas all bundled together. And we have bumped up the flight density quite considerably. So we haven't done anything with real data. What we did was jump onto a website where you can download um, sort of free tracking data that somebody sniffed from a um, transponders. And we then take three different hours and overlay them on top of each other. So we have a nice high traffic density and weird things going on that we can go and play with. Um, so that's the problem that we'll, um, we're looking at. We've made a load of assumptions as well. We assume that the initial 4D reference business trajectories are, are given to us. So these aircraft are flying around. These things are available for us to play with when they enter our area. Um, and we've taken those as just the tracks that we've recorded 
overlaid in time, as I mentioned a minute ago. Um, we also assume that we can play around with these trajectories and upload them to an aircraft and they will follow them. Uh, we haven't looked at the uncertainty issues yet, although of course they're very important. Um, and we haven't looked at the communication issues about how you'd achieve that, but we assume that we can come up with weird and wonderful trajectories and send them off to aircraft and they will be, um, they will be done. We've also assumed free routing, by which I mean that um, you, we are not bound to a particular route structure within our area. So we can send anyone anywhere within our area, uh, providing it's within their capabilities to fly, um, if that suits our goals of avoiding, uh, of maintaining separation. So here's the area we're looking at. Uh, we've taken a nice big area of the northwest of England and Wales. Um, so Bristol is somewhere down at this corner here. Uh, we get all the, uh, you know, lots of crossing traffic of people going up and down to the north of England and Scotland, crossing a lot of people um, going off transatlantic and transatlantic up here and heaven knows what else. So we've got a nice busy area that we're looking at and a nice big area with lots of traffic in it. Okay, so I'll come back to some examples in the case study. But to begin with, um, we start with the interaction from from the person to the optimizer. So we want to give the person some tools to be able to control what the optimizer does. And what we're looking for here is, is coming up with a discrete set of strategies or uh, behaviors or sometimes called plays that are useful to work with. And then we're going to encode those plays as constraints in the optimizer. So the idea is that you can go and switch on and off your different ways that you want to work. Um, this relates to the idea of the, the playbook model of autonomy that turns up in some of the, the, the literature on automation. Um, I think we have to be careful calling it the playbook because I think somebody went off and patented that. So it's not the playbook, it's a series of discrete strategies. Um, go figure. Uh, the set that we're going to look at are sim fairly simple and fairly obvious in a way, but they're interesting to translate. Uh, do you do things vertically or horizontally? Do you send someone over or under you? Um, do you go ahead or behind of someone else? And we also have an opportunity to say we just want you to resolve that one by speed changes. So the idea is that you go, you as the supervisor then have some interface where you can choose which ones you want to apply to which conflicts or which flights. Uh, and then you can, the optimizer will go away and tell you a solution um, that comes up with that. So the idea here is that you, the supervisor, are making high-level decisions. I want that to happen or that not to happen. And then the optimizer works out the very low-level decisions to make that happen. So the optimizer will deal with the numbers, X, Y, Z, and T, and uh, the human simply gets to deal with yeses or noes. So with over, under, um, fast and slow, or whatever it was, so the supervisor is already working at the level of Conflicts. I'm not sure I understand your question, to be sure. Um, well, the, presumably these, these, in, these indications that the supervisor is giving refer to aircraft in particular conflicts. Specific conflicts, yes. So I'll, I'll show you an example of that in a minute. So it's, but already, you... it's already quite a, it strikes me already that it's quite a low level of working. You've got a, um, some kind of conflict detection scheme that's thrown at the conflicts. Um, the supervisor looks at them and he decides what he wants in each case. Yeah, it's, it's, in, in, it's in each case, and I'll show you some examples of that. Um, there's no reason why having done the translations from the way, if you wanted to do sort of more global level things, so you want to say, I want to do everything this way, then you could, you know, that would be a simple sort of parallel wiring, if you like, but um, that's not something we've looked into. So uh, the first thing I want to talk about is what, what we call sense constraints, where you can constrain the sense of a resolution. For example, you can resolve over only horizontally, and that mathematically is very, very simple to do. You simply, when you're redesigning the trajectory, you fix the Zs and the Ts. Um, and everything else will, and so the X's and Y's can change. So you're forced, if, if two aircraft are in a conflict and they can't change that by changing their altitudes, then they are forced to resolve it by um, changing their, their horizontal um, routes. What you can further do is then go in and say who must go ahead of who. So it's not just saying you have to fix this without changing your vertical profile. You're also saying that actually I want you to be the one that goes ahead of the other one. And there's a variety of different ways of looking at this, but this fundamentally comes down to uh, things that, you know, there's a different way of doing this. So it's sort of uh, a lot of the things like rules of the air actually specify the sense of conflict. So there may be reasons why you prefer that, or there may be reasons for uncertainty, why you would decide actually I have more confidence in that one going around the front than that one going around the back. Um, so we've got uh, translations of that. And then, of course, we can do the same in vertical as well. So it, it's sort of exactly the, the dual of it. Uh, if you choose to resolve vertically, then immediately we fix the 
the horizontal profiles. And then you can go in further and choose a particular conflict and then say, in resolving this one, I want this one to be the one that goes over the top of the other one. So it's a very simple examples in, in just an initial, fairly simple two aircraft simulation. This on the left-hand side is the first resolution. And then this one, we haven't put any constraints in. So the optimizer will give us solutions that resolve all the conflicts there, and it will, it will, by default, it will just change everyone's trajectories to suit the needs. In this case, the best answer it's come up with sends this blue flight that we call number one. It descends a bit, goes underneath flight number two, and then returns to its flight level. And this one carries on its climb and levels off. So in this case, we can see that uh, flight two has gone over flight number one. Now, if for whatever reason we decided we, couldn't, we didn't like that, we can go in and simply say, I want you to do that the other way around. So we would then specify that one must go over two. We run it again, and now we get this answer, where one has clearly gone up and over the top of two, and two's actually done a sort of level off period, uh, things like that. The objective in here, I, I actually can't remember exactly what the objective was in this. So these, these probably look a little bit weird, but the main point of this is that we have asked for something to happen in a particular way, and it has been done. So we get what we want out of the optimizer. We can do the same in terms of sensor for uh, horizontal resolutions. So again, if we put, so here's two that are just crossing each other at the same altitude. In the left-hand case, uh, we haven't given any constraint on what the sense of resolution is, and what happens is that so two here goes round the front of one. And the separation regions here are actually quite small. There are little boxes marked on there. So they're quite big steps, and the separations on this scale are quite small. So they've actually maintained the separation, um, even if it doesn't look it on here. If we decide for whatever reason that we don't like that, so we don't like the idea of two cutting close out the front of one, then we can go in and say, actually, I want you to do that the other way around. So we can specify, I want two to go behind one, And sure enough, that will happen. So we can specify the sense and we get what we want. And I wanna show you some similar concepts then built into a bigger platform. So sticking all that together with more realistic data and into the MSC scenario I showed you earlier. Um, so I'll start by introducing the platform. Over here, we have a big list of flights. Down here we have a list of conflicts, so all pairs that are in conflict are highlighted for us. And then we have plan views and we have a cross-section view. This is horrible to interpret because we'll, we'll come back to why it's horrible to interpret in a minute. We can use it because we've learned how to use it and we can use it to check that things are working the way I expect. Um, so this isn't, as I said, intended to be an example of a good interface, but, but nevertheless it lets us go in and have a look and figure out what's going on. If we look more closely at the flight list, we have an option to go through for each aircraft and specify the types of resolution we want it to perform. So this is where we can fix. Do you want to, you know, do you want to fix your horizontal profile? Do you want to fix your vertical profile? Um, and this is where you go in and you can fix and say it's speed changes only. So you fix the, the, the 3D profile but allow it only to change the fourth. Um, so this is where we can go in and say by flight which ones are fixed. By default in this as well, it, it immediately hides and fixes anything that isn't in a conflict when we load the data set up. So that just basically saves us from an awful lot of clicking. Down here we have the conflict table which is where we can go in by pairs and say I want this one to be resolved by X going above Y or by X going behind Y and that's where we can set the senses. The initial view we can see here is where um, it pulls up and it highlights lights for us, the ones that are in conflict to begin with. So um, you can faintly grade out in the background there are a whole lot of things that are going through that aren't interacting with each other or anyone else. Um, but uh, these two here, so this DLH one coming across here and this AED one coming up here are actually in conflict um, there. And then there's another two coming in. There's one coming in from the right hand side and one coming up from the, the bottom right um, and they intersect there. So we have a couple of conflicts over there that we need to deal with. And those have been highlighted in, in there. So I want to show you the sense constraints, just simply used as an example in this platform. Um, we've, we've copied, because we had some discussion with Nat, so we basically came up with a sort of uh, a mimic of one of their IFAX displays just to show what the closest approach is. So 
We've got the time to conflict here and the, the horizontal separation. So it picks out the closest approach of each one and puts it in. So here, seen from the perspective of AED16, which is this one that's coming in from the bottom, we can see that we have a problem. We're going to have zero separation in about five minutes' time with this DLH one coming across the bottom there. And so that's been picked out for us. We can then go in and put in a sense constraint that say we want AED16 to pass behind the DLH. And sure enough, we see the AED. So it's a, it's a little hard to see this, but the red one is the old one plotted for comparison, whereas the purple one is what it's actually now doing. So we can see the AED is now turning to the left in order to go behind the DLH. And so it resolves in exactly the way we asked it to. And similarly, we can then switch the sense of that. So for whatever reason, we want the AED to go in front. We see the AED turn to the right, so it does go in front, and we see the DLH take a slight detour downwards or um, southwards um, so that it does indeed pass behind the other guy. Um, and in both cases, if you then go and look at the, uh, the mimic display up here, we can see that the separation has now been increased to the minimum. So it solved the, the thing in the way we wanted it to. I think I want to raise at this point is something we learned. So we had some discussions with Nats about what things you could do with this and, and uh, a thing that came out of that was the concept of what is the subject aircraft. Um, because what we do in the optimizer is we optimize for everyone who you haven't fixed. So there's a whole lot of people whose trajectories are changing at the same time, whereas uh, the more familiar way of working is to identify one subject aircraft, you make decisions for that subject aircraft, you look at the plots from the point of view of that subject aircraft, and that's the one you work with, and you work with one at a time. Um, I haven't got much of an answer for this because it, it's, it is a different way of working when you're working with an optimizer that can change multiple things at once. Um, there is a whole stream of work that we could look into that says, well, actually, if you do want to work with one at once, how do you avoid greediness and make things cooperative and go off into multi-agent systems and so on? Um, we haven't gone into all of that, but I, I just want to highlight at the moment is that um, this is why things get ugly here and things are, there's, some, there's some really challenges to being able to exploit this kind of thing because you have to move away from the model of thinking of just one aircraft at a time. First of all, just in selecting it, because actually you can select two at a time in our tool because you may want then to say, well, that pair I want to be, deal with in this way. Um, and, uh, and also just the way you think about what's going on when you push the button to say, come up with a new set of trajectories. So there's, there's some interesting open issues in there that will not. If you wanted to, yeah, you, you could go in and say, I'm, I'm going to fix that one and I want you to resolve by going behind it and it would come up with an answer. So, so you, the mathematics to be able to do that is in place. So you could adapt to the controller's preferred way of working at the cost of a non-optimal solution? Yes. Better than that, going slightly, looking further into the future, I think you could adapt to the one at a time way of working, but morph the objective function a bit to be able to reduce the impact on global optimality. Because we do have results on cooperative multi-agent optimization where each agent decides for itself, but where you optimize not just for the good of that one agent, but that agent also thinks, well, actually, what would the people around me maybe want to do? And actually, you can show mathematically that you can improve the overall behavior of the system a bit that way uh, and break out of some of these sort of greedy problems where if you know, one guy gets the best route and everyone else has to get out of the way. Um, so there's, there's some interesting stuff in there that we haven't gone into. Speed resolution as well. I showed you I mentioned this one as well. Um, so this is the idea where you fix the path, so you fix X, Y, Z, but T can change. Actually, we have a paper coming up in the ATM seminar on this, and one of the big questions we got asked was, how does this relate to the Erasmus concept? Because the Erasmus project um, looked at tiny speed changes, so it's, uh, I think what they called subliminal control, where they looked at very tiny speed changes, such that over long periods you could magnify the effect, and then conflicts would simply never appear. Um, in a sense, in terms of the optimization we're solving, it's actually quite similar. So once you, once you set everyone into speed resolution mode and say solve, you're solving the same problem as Erasmus would. But we're using that concept in a rather different way because Erasmus said, well, let's, let's look at that over a very big area so we have long periods for um, the speed changes to take effect, and then we'll use that so that humans never really need to get involved because the conflicts won't emerge, or at least that was part of it. Um, and also they were doing it in such a way where they said, well, actually the only thing we're going to change within the scope of this optimizer is the timing or the speeds. 
Um, what we're doing here is coming up with speed constraint as a configurable constraint that you can switch in or out. So we want not just to be able to change speed, but we want to be able to switch on or off the ability to change speed only or let everything else change within an optimizer with a much broader capability. And we're also using that not as a long-term solution to avoiding conflicts ever emerging, but we're using that as a specific play that a supervisor might want to use. So if, for example, you looked at a particular aircraft and you thought, you know, I like everything that that aircraft's doing and I've spent a long time figuring out what that's going to do, um, but I'd be willing to sort of trade a long track a little bit, but I'm, I need it to be doing the particular things that it's doing, then you'd switch it into speed mode. So it's using the same idea, but it's using it in a quite different way. Just to show you a very simple example again in, in a, a sort of subset of our, or our, um, of our case study again. So here we have two aircraft that are forming a conflict. So we've got uh, SHT-6G that's coming up. And they're both at the same flight level. So this one's coming up from the bottom. And then we have another one coming across from the right. And they come into conflict here. If we ask this to be uh, resolved with the two of them just in speed mode, then you can see that the, if I just sort of flick back and forth, which So you can see that the one coming across on the right has slowed down a bit. This one coming across here has sped up a bit so that we get more separation and now we have enough separation at that point. And if you, I haven't got the plot of the speeds, but if you look at the plot of the speeds, you can see where the speed changes are, are kicking in. Um, but you can also see that the, uh, the altitudes and the, and the rest of the profile hasn't changed. You need to be a little bit careful doing this. The mathematics is kind of interesting because if you fix them to be exactly on top of where they were before, it turns out to be massively over-constraining. Um, an example of this, although it's not quite clear because we're, we're looking at a different scale here, is something like a, a turn radius. So if you fix the XYZ profile in space, but you don't fix the time, you may potentially be fixing something like a turn radius. Um, and a turn radius is related to speed, so you may have inadvertently put a constraint on speed with the time. So what we have to do is put a very small margin that's carefully chosen to be much, much smaller than the separation constraint, but is just enough to allow the optimizer to find an answer. So what you're actually doing here is say, at all times, stay within a small corridor around the original constraint, and around the original RBT. And that works, but the other one, uh, if you over-constrain it, 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 it breaks down. A very quick Illustration of objectives. So uh, everything. So I haven't said very much about objectives. There's a variety of different objectives we can put in to be solved here. Um, so uh, this is with minimising time, um, and here we see people taking long, slow deviations. So for example, this one coming up from the bottom here. The red is its original route. It, it, it completely forgets about its original route. So we see a lot of changes but we see a nice smooth trajectory that gets back to where it was supposed to be. So you tend to see these long, uh, smooth changes with, with changes taking quite a long way to, uh, and to sort of recover. Okay. Uh, another one we played around with was minimum route deviation, which is where we say you can do a long track changes but minimize the uh, cross track or vertical changes from your original RBT. You can do a long track changes but minimize the uh, cross track or vertical changes from your original RBT. So the idea is that you want to get back to the other one quickly. Um, that can lead to some really, really weird results, which is why we, we, we threw those away in the end, or we, we haven't shown these in the rest of them. And, and Nats looked at those and said, why on earth are you doing that? So we stopped. But anyway, nevertheless, you can see that actually what it's done here is, so you, you can't really see the difference between them, and that's because basically they're on top of each other. The old and the new are on top of each other, so we end up with the same thing. But it, it may be uh, something that would be of, of relevance. The other thing we can do is reward separation. So um, another piece of feedback we had was that it was kind of scary that the optimizer would always drive people to the minimum separation. Now, if you run through the consequence of optimizing and you want to do that for minimum time, then that is the obvious consequence because you are going to, you know, if, if that's, you are going to drive things right up to um, the separation constraint um, because otherwise, well, why would, you know, the optimizer doesn't know. That's, that's the way it's posed. So one of the things we can do as well is put in a, a reward for greater separation where it's available. Now, this introduces all sorts of issues to do with trades and multi-objectives because, you know, there's now a sort of weighting on one versus the other and that makes life kind of complicated. So there's, there's issues with that. But in this case, if we just look at rewarding separation subjects as a no time change, then you can actually see a slightly greater deviation than is needed of this one coming up from the bottom um, to give greater separation. There are other games we played that I haven't got here about um, 
uh, different ways of doing separation and different models of separation. So, for example, you can put in a greater separation in front than behind. The, the results of that are slightly confusing because you still end up with the, with the same. So you, it sort of sounds like you want the one coming from behind to go around the back or something like that. And it doesn't quite work as straightforwardly as that. Um, so the examples aren't all that clear. But what you can do is say, uh, I, don't, I don't want you to cut through any space that I'm going to use in the next 10 seconds. And that's relatively easy or the next 10 minutes or something like that, depending on the horizon. So what that effectively does is extend your protected region forwards along your trajectory. <laughs> And that's kind of interesting because it basically moves away from a, a symmetrical protected region and it moves to a non-symmetrical protected region that is spread out along your trajectory, which is kind of nice because it gives you notice and you probably care more about things that are going to happen in front of you and along your path than things that are behind you because they may be easier to manage. So anyway, it's, it's, it's slightly unclear and I haven't got a, a lot to show about that, but we've looked at these different models and we can see the effect that they go in and they can all go in there. Um, the last one I want to mention is sequencing. So again, we showed some of this to Nats and they said, hey, could you do something so um, if we've already decided that we want a particular sequence downstream, can you put that in as a constraint? And the answer is that we can because it's exactly the same as the ahead behind um, stuff that I showed you a moment ago. So if two aircraft are required to exit our area at the same point, then they will be occupying the same space at that point, which means if we say that one has to cut ahead of the other, then uh, we are fixing the order. So it turns out that you can use exactly the same ahead behind things that we've developed to, separate, to require that sequencing. So to show you an example of that, here we have an initial RBT where we've got, we've got a DAL aircraft, the bottom one coming in here that for reasons that escape me sort of cuts in front of this one. And of course this isn't, this isn't real, this is real data, but mismatched in time. So it wasn't like anyone really cut in front of the other guy. Um, but this guy comes along and then cuts back onto the preferred route here. Uh, whereas the BAW one, the other one, is coming along straight. Um, and when we put these two together, we end up with a conflict at the exit point. If we simply tell our optimizer to say, okay, solve that, then what happens is that the purple BAW slows down the blue DAL smooths off its path so it's able to gain a bit of time. And so DAL exits ahead of BAW. But supposing we didn't like that, supposing we'd already negotiated with downstream that we wanted those two to be in the other order, we can put that in with the same ahead behind formulation. We end up with this, where what you can now see is that BAW speeds up and go straight there. It has to do a little bit of se uh, separate um, sort of movement to maintain separation. Um, but DAL now takes a quite circuitous route and slows down a bit such that actually it exits after BAW. So we can take, we can use exactly the same thing as we used for sense constraining and put it into um, to require a sequence. A little bit about how it works under the hood. So I, I'm Glossing over a lot of the details, I can give a lot more if you're interested, but uh, in terms of the mathematics. So um, under the hood, we have a mixed integer linear programming optimizer, which we can use a, uh, a massive commercial solver to get global answers for. Um, we don't have a supercomputer. Everything I've shown you runs in a few seconds on a, oh, how long ago did we start the project? Two-year-old desktop. We can get global solutions to the thing. And the way it works, because you have a non-convex optimization, so you have multiple local minima, solution this side or solution that side, um, that makes optimizations very hard, but this can solve them by branch and bound. Uh, and the way it works to handle this not is that it encodes separation as a set of discrete decisions. So you either have positive separation in X or negative separation in X or in Y or in Y or in height or in height. That should be an L for the level separation or the R. The, the, so we approximate the protective region around an aircraft as a box. Um, we also have in there, we've, we've adapted or we've, we've taken BARDA models of aircraft, so we're able to take the BARDA um, speed and height and climb performance tables and convert them into a representation of what the aircraft can do. So we have an aircraft capability model embedded in this optimizer as well. So it should never ask us to do anything that the aircraft can't do. The way it works then to actually do the super op tools is we go in and manipulate which of those discrete mechanisms are available to the optimizer or sometimes we add some more in. So for example, if we want to say that A passes ahead of B, we enforce additional separation constraints between B's current position and any future position of A. 
Now, the thing about the way that works is um, because you know, we're, we're optimizing, so I can look at what you're going to do in the future because I have your plan. I'm deciding it in the same computation as, as I'm deciding my own. Um, if I ever occupy a area in space that you in the future are going to occupy, then I must therefore have cut ahead of you and cross your path. So if I use that same separation constraint that I have for the same times, but actually apply it between my time and your future time, then there's no way I can cut across the front of you because I can't occupy that space because you're going to occupy it. So we can take these ideas of a head behind and convert them into the same separation constraints. So it's exactly the same in terms of what the maths looks like, but applied with shifts in time. Vertical resolution only, I've told you already, that's quite forward. Um, the A crosses above B is quite interesting because um, if you imagine two aircraft where one crosses across cross the top of the other, it doesn't mean that they can't one time one will be below the other. So I, for example, you could be level and I could go across the top of you, but that doesn't mean that I was at some time below you. So I can't just say, you know, I am always above you because I'm actually starting below you. I'm still crossing across the top, but I'm starting below and I'm going to above. So what I have to do is take out the option that says I can be directly below you. And if I take out, so basically I'm extending the protective region downwards to the ground, and that means that I can't fly directly underneath you. And if we put it in that way, which for us is just turning off a binary variable, so it turns out it's quite straightforward in terms of the optimizer, if anything, it makes it simpler, um, then we can achieve this thing where I can't, you know, I have to resolve by going over the top of you. So those are just a few examples of the kind of the mathematical translation, the way you do the sort of geometry and figure out how does the, the desire convert to the, um, the mathematics. We've done all of this in a, in a second optimizer as well. Um, you may be thinking that you want another optimizer like you want a hole in the head. So why have we done this? Uh, we've done this because when you look in the literature, there's some really nice results on optimization for things like noise and emissions, where people have done some quite careful modeling of um, things like noise impact on takeoff. Uh, but the models of those are horribly nonlinear. Um, and they don't fit, they don't meet the mathematical requirements to be able to put into our big mixed integer linear programming solver. And so what we've done is identify whether or not we can do the same plays, the same strategies into a nonlinear. Um, we haven't done very much with it, but if you did want to go and take, you know, the stuff out of so-and-so's paper from the ARAA last year on noise minimizing departures, and you wanted to put in the ability to supervise it, we can tell you how to do that. So that's all developed. Um, we've also, along the way, there's a boatload of things that we've played around with on both optimizers. I've spared a lot of the detail of that, um, but for example, uh, multi-vehicle trajectory optimization with nonlinear optimizers had a massive hole in it, and that's something that we've fixed in terms of being able to do separation. Um, and it turns out it's quite cool because you can, in a nonlinear optimizer, you can actually pose the whole thing as 4D. Um, you can actually put in time as a decision variable, and that gives you some interesting possibilities. So we've exploited them to a certain extent. Um, and there's also some work being done in the MILP. In doing this, we found some holes in the way these optimizers work. So for example, to get quick communicate computation time, you don't want to be looking at positions at very fine spacings because that just means you've got thousands of constraints and it takes a very long time to solve. But if you look at very coarse spacings, there is a risk that I could be okay here, I could be okay here, but in the middle where I wasn't looking, I've smacked straight through the middle of someone else. We've been able to put in very simple modifications to the constraint where you can assure, so this is why you see these pictures of tubes on our um, plots. We can assure of, uh, separation through between two tubes by only knowing the endpoints. So we can actually do quite coarse separation optimization and we can dial in uh, a trade between performance and precision of trajectory and get the computation time down without having to sacrifice um, performance. So that was one side of it. That was the optimizer, sorry, the human telling the optimizer what to do. There is a second side of it, of course, is where the optimizer tells the human what it has done. Um, so this is about presenting the results. The results in their raw form are a bunch of numbers. Um, you've already seen, of course, that I've, I've produced those as, as some reasonably straightforward plots. Um, the big deal here is that we want the optimizer to tell the human why it is doing what it's doing. So why was the answer to the question you just asked this thing that I'm presenting to you now. So there's two main tools for this. One is active constraints and the other one is the cost history. And then I'm going to show a bit of extra thing which doesn't quite fit into this flow but is interesting nonetheless about extracting alternatives right at the end. 
The first one is the active constraints. Um, the active constraints is this idea of where, where are you actually, where are they actually touching? Where are the two non-overlapping volumes actually up against each other? And it relates to the idea of closest approach. So if you want the separation to always be greater than this, then the point where it is that is the point where the constraint is active. So the nice thing is that these come straight out of optimizers as a byproduct. So you don't need to do any extra work. You don't need to search through the trajectories or do anything clever about checking if this time is equal to that time or if they're close enough, whatever. The optimizer will just highlight them for us. So both of these plots were generated by simply taking the bar. You just get the optimizer to spit out the points where the constraints are active, and you can go straight to the plot. So it's very easy for us to translate back into this. The tricky part is formulating the constraints such that there's a direct and straightforward link between what you want to see on the plot and what comes out of the optimizer. Um, and that's a little bit fiddly. I'm not going into a lot of detail that, but it's all to do with how you formulate the min time and max time, and, and sorry, the min separation and max separation and things like this. So this allows us to then link things. Again, we're not human factors guys, so it's not very clear, but for example, this turned up in some of the demonstrations we were doing when we had something weird happening where there was a, a knock-on effect. So we had an aircraft and we told it to go around the back of another one and then it was doing something weird afterwards. And it turned out that that was because it was avoiding a conflict with another aircraft that was greyed out. Now that of course is horrible human factors, there's something going on that's hidden from you, but that's not our business as I've probably overemphasized now. So what we then do is go in and we just we, we can easily mark little lines and say well the reason you're doing that there is because you're up against a constraint there. So it's very hard to see. We can we, we learn to use it so that it tells us what's going on. Um, but nevertheless, the optimizer can extract for you and then hopefully present in some form exactly what was it that caused it to do that. The other thing I want to show you is the cost history. So this, this is a slightly earlier version of the tool. Um, if you look up in the top right here, this is what I'm calling the cost history. So you solve once, and I'm not going to go into too much about exactly what the scenario is at this point, but you solve once and it'll give you a normalized representation of what the cost was, and then this pink bar is telling you that that is the one you are looking at at the moment. So the workflow here is that we start and the horizontal box is ticked. So this is solving everyone's cases horizontally. And then what we do is we say we don't like that, so we click the vertical box and we solve again. So now, and then what we do is we say we don't like that, so we click the vertical box and we solve again. So now we're on to our solution history item number two, and the cost has come down. So evidently vertical worked better in terms of this particular cost for that um, example. And supposing we then look at that and say, well, okay, that's, that's all right, but I don't like the order of some of the climbs. So we put in a sense constraint here. So that's a, a sense constraint that's just turned up. We want one of these to go over the other one where before it was going under. Of course, we just made the problem harder, so the cost goes up. But crucially, this tells us that the cost has gone up not by as much as it would if we went back to do everything horizontally. So it's giving us a little bit of insight on what, uh, what's going on. And then if we want another one, well, we can put... Uh, another constraint in and we can look at that. So the idea is that you now have this history and the other thing we give you is a back button. So this starts to look a little bit like a web browser. You can basically just go back and forth. I'm just doing it on the slide here, so I'm cheating. But you can keep the, um, you can keep the old history up and you can go back and forth. So the idea is that you can then get to the point of a workflow where you try something, evaluate its effect, and you don't have to just look at one objective, you could actually look at a whole sort of screen of them if you want to, it's as much as you want to look at. But you know, if you've chosen the things that you care about, and you then simply say, well, you know, okay, that does that, mm, that makes it worse, I'll go back to the other one and I'll take that one. It's the beginnings of an idea of a collaboration workflow, um, but presenting this cost history, we think, and allowing you to navigate forwards and back through it, it's a fairly simple idea, but um, we think it could be part of it. Last thing I want to talk about is this idea of generating alternatives. So the point here is that nearly all of these optimizers are iterative algorithms. In fact, I think every optimizer is an iterative algorithm. So it's always trying things at every step to see how good they are. And then it makes a change to the thing it tries and it tries again. Um, so you're, it, you're evaluating lots of different trial solutions. Um, but what we normally do is just get one out at the end. So we get the best one that it found is given back to us. And in the case of the MLP, we happen to know that is the best one that there can be because that is the nature of that optimizer. Um, but the question we have here is whether or not we could use the other things that we've developed along the way to give the supervisor a choice about what it is they might want to do. So this relates to this. There's one of the level, I can't remember which one it is, but on the, um, the, the, the Parasuraman's automation scale, I think one of them is choice of alternatives. Um, so there's this idea of could we use the optimizer to, to produce those alternatives. So one thing you could do is just simply say, well, great, I'll take six, you know, the best six you found on your way, please. But the catch with that is that they'll often be similar. So I'll show you an example of that and I'll show you what we do about it. 
To do this, we went to a completely different example. So apologies for completely jumping ship, but we were going to play around with two case studies in this, and this is where we did something different. So in this case, we're doing a flow management example. It's completely fictitious. We've used Voronoi diagrams to generate imaginary fixes and imaginary airports and heaven knows what else. So, but hopefully it's, it's still got the, the features of a traditional um, flow management because we've got uh, basically arrival constraints at each of these five airports. So we've got 100 flights leaving from each airport scattered over a sequence of their sort of required or their preferred departure times. Um, we've got a different flight time between each one and then we've got a, so we've got a sort of initial preferred arrival time and then we allocate delays to respect arrival flow rates at each of the um, destination airports. So we're, we're solving a, a rather cut down version of the flow management problem. And we're trying to solve it for minimized delays. We are solving this by simulated annealing, which is a big randomized optimizer, which is based on uh, you basically slot swap, and then you may or may not choose it based on a random outcome. So it's a, it's a simulated annealing heuristic based on slot swapping um, as the minor change. I don't really want to tell you that it's the right one to do the job. It solves our needs because it generates a whole pile of different solutions. So our objective here was to simply you know, show that you could go through a, a big history of things that have been tried and show and, and make some sense out of them and extract some alternatives. So the idea here is just to come up with a trial optimizer that we can then bolt this post-processing idea on the end. What you're looking at here then is the six best solutions. So each column is a solution. So this one on the left is the best one it found um, and it was working to minimize that it, it was minimizing a blend of the average delay and the max delay. So 400 to 500 the ones leaving from airport 5, 0 to 100 the ones leaving from airport 1 and so on. Um, it doesn't tell you where they're all going but then the, the lines, so you can see these are done in order of departure time and then the, the longer the line is the longer it was delayed and the redder the line is the longer it was delayed. So it's a hard, it's a hard thing to do but it, hopefully the point is that by, you know, screw your eyes up a minute and look at these and ask yourself if you can see the difference. No, I can't. I, spent, I was looking at this again before I gave the presentation. I really can't see it. There are differences because the average costs come out to be different for each one. But these are the last. Six, these are the best six solutions. So you go through, you sort all the solutions you tried, and you pick out the best six because these ought to be the ones you're interested in. The catch here is that if you've got an optimizer that converges, the best six are the ones you're finding at the end, just when you're getting to the bottom of the hill. So of course they're all quite close to each other, and there's probably only one slot swap difference between each one of these. And so therefore it's very, very difficult. You know, we, if you can present those six to, an, to a supervisor, even if you could find a good way of presenting them, you're not really presenting a meaningful range of alternatives that you could pick from. So what we've done is adapt some ideas that sort of come from clustering theory, where you're looking at sort of grouping solutions and separating solutions. So you define a, a metric of the difference between two solutions, which in our case, we just take the difference between all the delays, add them all up and square root them and so on. So you're just taking the norm of the difference between all the numbers. And that can allow us to quantify. So if we take the best solution, so we take out the best one, Actually, no, we don't even take out the best one because here's, here's the best one and we're plotting across the bottom is how different are you from the best one and up the side is what is your performance index or what is your cost. So this is this blend of, of max and average. And so, of course, this one down the bottom here, this one in the bottom left is the best solution we found because that's identical to itself and has the best cost. And then as you get further away, you're getting worse and worse and worse and you're also getting more different. So you can actually see that there's something, uh, you know, there's, there's some weird behavior in here where there's sort of stepping, where there's, there's, there must be some change in here that makes things really, really bad in a hurry, and then you can make small changes around that, and things don't get worse. But um, So what we're interested in doing then is doing a sort of multi-objective optimization across this space. So we want to choose one that's somehow over in the bottom right, because that's one that hasn't given up too much cost, but gives us a nice big difference in the one we found already. So the way we do that is relatively straightforward. You draw a line between the best one you have and then the worst one you have, or the worst feasible one, and this point up here. So basically, you, it's the bounding box of all the solutions in this space. And then you pick the one which is furthest away from this line. So uh, on this case, I think it's this one is the next one that's picked out next. And what you then do is you go around again, but your new difference metric is not just how different are you from the best one, but it's how different are you from any one that you found. So basically the new metric is the smallest of the difference from the best one before and the difference of the, of the one you've just picked. So it's like clustering theory. It's basically how far are you from anything that's already in the bag. And you go through that and you can do that as an iterative process and pick out as many as you want. That process applied to the same data set gives you this six 
over here. Again, each column is a solution. Can you see the difference? This time, yes, you can. We can't interpret it very well, but nevertheless, we have six meaningfully different solutions that have given up a certain amount on cost. So if you look at what the averages are in numbers at the top, we've given up a bit more than, you know, if we take the six best, we will get the six best. These are not as good in terms of cost as the six best, but as a range of alternatives to choose from, this is much more useful. We compared this to what happens if you just run the same algorithm, because remember, the algorithm's random. What happens if you run it another five times? The spread of difference and cost is about the same, and yet that took six times more computation. So what we have is a relatively efficient way of, uh, I sort of think of it, it's like, it's like remining on spoil tips. You're going through the waste tip of your optimizer output, and you're picking out things that may turn out to be useful, and you're going straight to the ones that are of most use to you, potentially. So this is this way of generating different alternatives. Okay, that's about me wrapping up. In conclusion then, I wouldn't claim, I, I don't claim that SuperOpt has shown how optimization can work for air traffic control. That's a much bigger question than we have looked at. What I do think we've done is at least shown ways that you can start to learn about and to start to bring it into the fold and, and start to find this sort of middle ground between becoming an optimizer researcher and just being stuck with an answer. So I think we've addressed a lot of the question we set out to do. Again, we had a big discussion with Nats about this and, and what came out of that was interesting because it was a clear understanding of what we thought we'd actually done. And what they were interested in was if you accept that some form of trajectory optimization is going to need to be sort of developed, then it needs to be developed without making a massive jump to a high level of automation. So what we provided, we hope, is a way of starting to experiment with optimization and bring it in as an experimental tool and something that you can fiddle with and learn with without having to make the enormous leap to a completely automated solution. So this is our idea about something to do with a low level of automation. Um, but of course, the, the human factors questions to do with subject aircraft and your internal model of what's happening and so on are, are all very open. In terms of future work and ongoing work, we want to work with a wider range of objective and constraints. So I talked about the possibility of bringing in some of these models and things like that, that's stuff we're looking at. We also want to change our models a bit about separation constraints so that it's not just there is separation, but also that it looks like there will be separation, which is a slightly stronger requirement. And it turns out there's a nice link up with that between what we call passive safety in spacecraft control, where you make sure that even if you turn the whole lot off now and everyone just kept going where they're going, there would be no problem. We can put that in with very similar ideas to what I was saying about projecting forward and backwards in time. And so the idea is that maybe we could present something that isn't just, you know, it, it's not just right, but it looks right, which I think could be a, a slightly stronger thing to provide. The biggest thing we're interested in is then starting to fold uncertainty into this. So we know that there are uncertainty envelopes that comes with trying to follow certain trajectories depending on modes of operation. And we think we can use this tool as a basis for exploring the impact of that. And that's just something we're really only starting to think about. And that's everything I've got to say. Thank you very much. And I'll take any questions. I have a question about the second slide for the objectives of this work. Okay. Your work is not about optimizer, of course. Uh, you work about the question box. Yes. And the interaction between the human and the question box. Our, our work is about what's in this box, with these two boxes, yes. Okay. So we have left to our own devices, we would spend a long time tinkering with what's in here. We have disciplined ourselves not to do that in this project and exploited what already exists in here and concentrated on what would be in these boxes. What was the result of the interaction with the suggestion? The interaction with the suggestion, this is this idea about we, the, the, so what we, things we've developed in this box are the generation of alternatives algorithm, the, um, product, the analysis of uh, active constraints, and the um, uh, what was the other one we did? And the cost history and the, and the, and the presentation of, of how the cost changes. So suggestions is probably the wrong word for that. What I'm, what I'm trying to get, I mean, I hadn't introduced this idea of rationale and this idea of a more interpreted idea. So suggestion is probably the wrong, the wrong phrase to have there. But what we, we have come up with stuff that we can present out here that is much more useful than just that. So that's the intent there. Was there any feedback from controllers as to whether there would be time to explore alternatives and so on? Because this can be a process you can do forever, play with older 
option. You know, we've had people visit and come and look at it and look at it and, and give us some feedback. We haven't done a, a formal exercise where we put it in front of a controller and said, play with this and, and tell us what you think and here's a questionnaire. Um, computation time has yet to prove to be a big problem for us, so we can get you know, answers within a second or two, although I still think that needs to be faster and that's another aspect of our work, but because that lives in the mystery box over on the right, that's something we do internally and through other things. So, um, As to whether or how much a human would want to explore, I mean there's a sort of trade in terms of uh, the operator's internal desire there about do you want to spend a long time doing it or do you want a reasonable answer quickly? Um, I'm not sure that's one I'm, I'm well placed to uh, uh, to address, but I certainly agree that that's one of the open questions, which is, you know, I, I don't see people wanting to sit around choosing the best from 10 solutions and clicking buttons until they come up with things. So the idea, this is one of the ideas of the alternatives algorithm and things like this, is how can we present, how can we pick out what are likely to be the most useful ones first, so you're not 10 clicks away from the one you probably want to go with, in which case you'll probably never find it. There are some other questions, what if command is something that you use? Simulation okay. It's kind of what if, if you change what happened, it was integrated in many of our tools. That would be something going. They, they are using this to, yeah. to see if it's changing the profile, if it's changing horizontal and vertical. So such kind of could exist. But what's interesting is what's the feedback from the controller about using different optimizers. Right. There's a lot of merging of traffic flows in their traffic control where you intentionally want aircraft to fly in trails at a certain distance. Do you know if the optimizers could handle that as, as well as the diverging geometries that uh, you probably encountered in three, three routes? There's no mathematical reason why it shouldn't. Kind of teetering on the separation. Intentionally. Well, that's exactly what the optimizers tend to do anyway, so that, that would be the kind of behavior that's very clear. But it, it, it would depend on what objective you were looking at, because our, if, you, if you look for the route that's most preferable in terms of time, I'm not sure you'd see ours do that, because that's when they tend to go off the routes most and just go straight to where they want to be. So if you imagine, if you had two converging and then going off to do something like that, an optimizer for min time that just says, even if it said just exit in this sequence, they probably just forget the merge and go, and they just go straight to the point they were going to exit. So you may not see that behavior, depending on what your objective was. If you set the objective to try and say, stay on the existing root structure, then you would see the merge. And if you were saying to get out min time, but stay on the existing root structure, you'd see exactly that, because the back one would be driven to, um, to be right on the limit with the front one. So I think you, you could certainly reproduce that behavior. Um, whether or not you want to sort of introduce it as a, as a sort of specific strategy uh, would be something interesting to, to think about. Uh, is the optimizer able to switch between different uh, optimization strategies in the sense that uh, if uh, with the first strategy it uh, didn't find a solution, is it able to go and try another one? Uh, that's certainly something we can code in. It's not something we've done. Um, one of the things I've got someone working on at the moment, which I'm really interested in, is running two different ones in parallel. So this to me is, is the sort of software solution to redundancy. Uh, you, you have two different algorithms and then trying to get those even to talk to each other as well to make the whole thing. So that's something that we're looking at. Um, I mean, fundamentally, it's quite straightforward. You just, I mean, we can, we can certainly detect because the optimizer gives you enough status output that you can say whether or not we've got an answer. Mm -hmm. So you can, what we tend to do a lot of time is, is we've got a time limit on it and then we can detect and it'll come back and say, oh, you timed out and you didn't get a feasible answer. Or you timed out and we did get an answer, but it's not the best. So we can get quite a lot of status information, which you might then use to trigger another protest. Um, one of the kind of standard criticisms of uh, resolution algorithms and tools is that uh, controllers become dependent upon the tool um, and then effectively they switch off mentally and so that um, in fact you no longer really have a, a controller there, it's the tool, the tool is doing everything and then when a surprising situation occurs um, the controller doesn't understand what's going on and he actually has no added value. So do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, 
that's a question slap bang in the area that I told you I wasn't qualified in, isn't it? Um, do I have any thoughts on that? It's an interesting one. Because you know, the, it gets stated and says, I think it was there in your objectives. Um, people want the human being there, which means the human being has to understand what's going on. But then if you have a tool which is very reliable, which does the job very nicely, the human being can think you're thinking about his summer holiday. It's an interesting question. It is one that's come up for me before in a, in a different context. Um, if you still need the human to be on the ball and well trained, ready for the solution, or ready to interject on a day when the tool doesn't solve your problem, then I don't think the tool is reliable as people have come to think it is. So therefore, I, I think um, uh, I. I this is why I'm careful to say I, I don't think this is the solution to everything because I don't, you're right, there will be cases where maybe it wouldn't work and then what would you do? Um, so the, you then have two routes. Well, you know, do you switch it off so you've got your person or you switch it off for 10% of every day so your person is still well trained or something like this and you just have a training regime that keeps up the skills or do you work on the tool so it becomes more reliable? And I don't, I mean, one of the big questions, which is a problem right across the autonomous systems capability, or sorry, community, which is how do you gain trust in an autonomous system? And nobody's really got any good answers to it other than it's really, really hard. Um, because at what, oh, you're right, at what point do you stop worrying about skills degradation because you trust your tool enough that you, you don't feel you need those skills at all anymore? Um, I don't think we have a good answer to that. Uh, one of the interesting questions which I think that does rise, which is, in, is that, um, is the way that the tool is designed. And I know that sometimes if you go from the very beginning to design your optimizer to work in the way that the human would, so you constrain your optimizer to say, you're going to be a decision support tool, which means you're not going to surprise the person you're working with. And so therefore, you're going to be constrained to the set of actions that they would normally use anyway. Then on the day when their actions wouldn't work, your tool will always break down. So the day when they need the tool the most, is the day the tool breaks. So I think one of the interesting issues that that question arises is to try and make sure that when you're designing an automation tool, you're not driven by making it work the same way the person works. Because actually, the optimization tool will prove more useful if it can do the weird and wonderful things, which is what the human mm. would struggle to do on the day when things aren't going the way. So I think that has interesting implications for, for just what is your motivation and what are your drivers when you're developing decision support tools like this. I had a, a, another project which looked at something related but from a very different angle, from a human factors angle, and they are, after the experiments they've conducted, they are arguing in favor of presenting solutions to the human operator which are conformed to how the human operator would have solved the uh, uh, the problem himself. So you got different controllers having different the different ways of solving one specific problem. One controller does it this way, the other controller does it that way. And they found out that the controller is more likely to accept uh, solutions that are similar to how he would have uh, done it himself. That seems straightforward, but that for them is an argument in favor of adaptive uh, uh, optimization. Is that show the controller things that he's, he would have been likely to have done himself. I, dis I disagree with that finding in a way because I think that the controller strategies will evolve over time. So you should mm. be building automation that works similar to the way a controller works today, but the controller will work differently in the future. With automation support, yeah. he, will be, he will be working towards a numerically optimal solution. An example for that is speed control, for example. Speed control, in most cases, is the most efficient way of solving problems. But it's not done by controllers because the cognitive cost of speed control, anticipating, calculating, and figuring out, is just too high. Controllers can't handle it. But if you have automation that helps them do that, uh, then they're probably more likely to use these uh, solutions in the future. Yeah. I think what you're pointing your finger at, Richard, is a bit of a dilemma in a way because we're uh, introducing automation support to controllers in order to uh, leverage them to make them handle more traffic to, diff to work on, the, on a different level. So we cannot, in all cases, expect them to be able to do the job when we take all the tools away. So that gradually, th there will be lower level uh, activities that you will not be able to perform. And if only because you're handling more traffic with the work. One of the things that's coming, again, in, in the autonomous systems community, in the UAV community, and autonomous things like that, where I, I also do some research, 
Um, people tend to say, oh, yeah, no, of course it's safe, of course it's trustworthy, because it's got a joystick. You can always switch it back over to joystick mode. And that approach is now being, uh, it's becoming discredited because it's recognizing that you've gone to the higher level of automation. So as you say, you can do more than you currently do. So the idea of suddenly saying you're going to switch it all off and have a joystick there, and it's like saying, oh, great, look, I can, I can be automated and I can have a cooperative um, team of six UAVs. And I've only got two people in the, in the, in the cabin. Well, you know, they can't fly six joysticks, so immediately your joystick mode breaks. So this idea about saying it's a decision support tool and if all else fails, you turn it off is kind of, I agree, a broken model of saying this is how I'm going to trust my automation. So I think what, what we may be arriving on is that the only way to do it is to basically find a way of just gaining trust in the automation in the same way as you can trust a person. And that's what's interesting about the kind of solutions that you're, because the reason we trust a human is potentially because we, we believe that the human has the capabilities to surprise us with the problems they can deal with. Because a good autonomous system is one that can deal with a situation that we haven't thought of. Otherwise, it's just something where we thought of every possibility and we pre-programmed an action. And that's straightforward. We can trust it. We can build it. Away you go. It's very, very limiting in terms of what it can do. Because have you thought of every possible bad day? We like humans as a, as a solution to this because we know that humans are very creative and can come up and surprise us with solutions for the really, really bad day that we haven't thought of yet. Um, and so actually, a good autonomous solution would also be able to surprise us. And yet what we're saying is that in order to trust it as a decision support tool, it should never surprise us. So you're right, we end up with a massive dilemma. Um, do you, and, and that's about as far as we can go with it at the moment, I think. There's another dilemma, which is you only trust something that you use, and you only use something that you trust, so it's kind of a big it's, Exactly. From an operational point of view, finally it's a, it's a tactical tool. Because you, you are signing the presentation to the multi-sector uh, supervisor. But yeah. in fact, it's uh, something which helps to solve, uh, detect and solve a conflict. Uh, yeah, we have probably mixed up some of the terms in terms yeah, of the timescales and things like that. Um, there's no reason, cons I mean, we've tended to, end with the demonstrations we've ended up doing, it looks kind of like somebody sitting at a desk resolving conflicts in, in a sort well, of tactical way. If you, but if you had a special reason to, to apply this to a wider area, or just you can focus on a, just one, upon a single sector as well? You could try it for whatever problem you chose to throw at it in terms of sort of the, the mathematical, I mean, the big deal for us is the mathematical translation. So if we could formulate a different problem, then we could start to throw these tools at it. Um, the, we, we chose to go the way we did because it, it just looked a bit weird and wonderful and stretched them in ways that we thought, so we, we found it was a nice study for us. But yeah, you could use it in different ways. I think typically you tested on the en route part of the flight. Mm -hmm. Did you have any idea if you would work for a TMA? We'd love to, and we started trying because we have these nonlinear approach optimizers and things that, and so other people have published things on optimizers for TMAs um, that work beautifully and would be compatible with what we've done, but we basically haven't had time to do it all and stick it all together. It, it's an open question. Have you come to, you said you've been playing around with the uh, integer linear programming with non-linear optimizers. Uh, how do they compare in uh, calculation time and have you tried hybrid optimizers to solve that? We haven't tried hybrid. It, it's on our list because we have it we have it as a, I mean, we use these optimizers for a number of different things in different application domains, and, and this hybrid idea is one we really want to try. We haven't tried it in this conflict and we, in this context, and we haven't tried it with um, with nonlinear and, and MILP working together. Um, in terms of which is which is better and which is faster, um, the MILP is probably the most reliable, the most and even the fastest, despite the fact that it gives us best answers. But I think that's because, I mean, we, we buy an MILP solver, which gives us a lot of reliability in terms of getting the solutions out, whereas the nonlinear solvers that we use are free ones that are available to the research community. And in fact, I'm not even sure there are that many big, expensive, you know, mi mixed integer linear programming can solve things like um, Delta's fleet, or sorry, I don't think Delta even exists anymore, but they were the case study when the paper came out. They do big like airline fleet assignments and heaven knows what else. So they're very, very well developed, and very expensive, sold for the business community. So we can piggyback on their development. There isn't really the same community that pulls along nonlinear optimization in quite the same way. 
Um, so that's something that we'd have to fill around with. So they have the potential, but in practice at the moment, we haven't really got the same capability in nonlinear as we have in MALP, which is why we took the MALP into the more advanced demonstrator. I saw the, the MATLAB icon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry, I, I forgot to say that, didn't I? Yeah, it's all MATLAB. Yeah. <laughs> you called it everything in MATLAB? Or yeah. We like MATLAB. It's kind of what we do. Oh, Dan likes that. Um, oh, OK. Um, I kind of want to move into Python, because I think there's a lot you can do with that. But I'm not sure that makes things any better for you. Sure. Thank you. More questions? Well, that's not the case. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you very much. Thank you.